I was thinking this morning, Brother Ed, I, re I remember the first time I heard you preach, back 1974, in the Evangelist Club, Tennessee Temple. And he preached on they that honor God, God will honor them. And I was about starved to death and went in there that morning and he got to preach. And I said, now this is what I like. This is good. This is good. Good to have Brother Ed Ballou with us. How many of you have never heard Brother Ed Ballou before? Any of you? All right, several of you. Let's give Brother Ed a good welcome to the church here. It's my joy to be here with you today and to see many that I have known for well, we won't go any farther than that. But I have, and you have, and we appreciate you. Wonder if the ladies, just the ladies, would do me a special favor this morning. Just the ladies, you ladies and girls, do me a special favor. I've enjoyed the music so much, so much, so very much. Been a blessing to my heart, an inspiration, an uplift. But I want you to do something for me. Don't let me down. I don't feel like you will, but I want you to do something for me. Just the ladies, just you girls. I want you to sing a verse of an old song that becomes more precious to me every day of my life. I'll start you off. I don't want you to sit there timid now and not sing it. I want you to sing it. Make melody in your heart. I'll start you. I want you to sing it a cappella. Now as we sing. There is a fountain Father, we love you this morning. Yes, thank you, I thank you that one day, many years ago, yes. you washed us clean in the precious blood of the Lamb. Yes. I praise your name for this open door this morning, this opportunity again to proclaim thy word that is forever settled in heaven. I thank you for this great church, this pastor, this ministry. Thank you, dear Lord, for the choir and for the musicians and all that makes up this local assembly. Yeah. For their outreach around the world in missions wherever God the gospel of Christ is preached. I thank you, God, today for that. Yeah. Now have your way, we pray, as we come before this congregation. Make our tongue a ready writer's pen. God, touch hearts. God, I pray for those that are hungry, you'll feed them. Those that are thirsty, you'll give them drink. Those that are discouraged, you'll encourage them. Those, God, that are down, you'll lift up. And those that are up too high, you'll bring back down. Have your way today. We'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Just a very brief announcement, just very briefly. On the table here in front, you will find a small Bible marker. Announcing an annual meeting over at Cleveland. Now, you know where Cleveland's at. That's the holy city. We want you to... <laughs> Brother Frank and a lot of folks said, where, where are you from? I said, well, actually, I live between Cleveland and Dalton. I can expose you to tongues or carpet, either one. <laughs> and they say, we sure would like to know some about carpet. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> But we have an annual meeting over at Cleveland, sponsored by the way of the Cross Baptist Church, that my brother is the pastor, and it's swiftly approaching the date of its beginning, the week of June the 19th. June the 19th. We assemble at the great 
Khan Center, the Khan Center. Seat about 1,600 people, and we want you to come. We want to give you an invitation. The services will begin each, and we'll have good preaching. We major in preaching, major in preaching. Have some good singing, but major in preaching. Now, if you don't like to hear good preaching, why, my dear friend, there wouldn't be a great deal of coming. Just, just come on over and hear some good preaching. Be with us in this great time. My brother pastors the Way of the Cross Baptist Church and gives to each of you an invitation. They furnish each day lunch and supper at no cost. You'll have a good time, good time. Folks will be traveling in from all over the country. And we'll just have a great time in the Lord. I'm glad to have my Miss America with me today. My Miss America. Honey, would you stand, please? Would you stand up there? She don't like to do this. She's like me. She's, she's awful shy. She's awful shy, like me. But, uh, she told one of the kids one day, she said, Honey, be good. This little kid, the kid said, uh, I'll be good for a dollar. She said, why aren't you like your daddy? He said, he's good for nothing. <laughs> so, we're glad to have my Miss America. Been together all of these years. She said, you said, well, what if you were to leave you? I'll go with her. <laughs> I'll go with her, yes, sir. Open your Bibles now to the book of Acts, please, chapter 28. They sang that song a while ago. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. I have a dear preacher friend of mine. He's a, well, he, he's as black as a million midnights, but he says he's mahogany. And uh, he said, uh, uh, he calls us strawberry folks. He said, you strawberry folks sing that song. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. But he said, us black folks say, don't call that roll till we get there. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, I'm glad today to be with you. In Acts chapter 28, I want to just set the scene for it and then get into this and I'll read it for you. <laughs> Button. <laughs> Imagine, if you will, here is a very small ship out just off of an island. It's a raging storm, a very, very venomous storm, just raging. The winds are roaring. The rains are coming down in torrents. Uh, lightning is flashing. Please get the picture. And out there on the, on the water is a little ship, not a large ship in comparison today. In fact, a very small ship. But here it is being tossed angrily about like a little ball on the waves. This is the island of Melita. And I imagine the occupants may have got a glimpse of that, sh that stormy picture and maybe have ventured down to the edge of the water. They're watching. Their prophecy concerning the ship no doubt said it will soon sink. It cannot retain its status on top of the water. Soon it will be under. That was their diagnosis for the situation. On board that ship is a little 110 pound preacher. They say many things about him, but he stands among that crowd and said, We'll suffer the loss of none. Nobody's going to drown. We're all going to make it. And then he said to those on board, when the ship goes under or goes down, you swim to land. And you that cannot swim, you know it's amazing how God makes provisions for all of us. So you that cannot swim, just grab a piece of the broken vessel and head for land. Now that brings us to chapter 28. We were talking to you about 27. And when they were escaped, note that, underline it. Now the God's prophecy had come true. And when they were escaped, I believe they all escaped too. 
they knew that the island was called Melita, and the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hanging on his hand, they said among themselves, I want you to get this here. Look up here at me. I, if, if there's anything in the world that convinced me that these occupants of the island were Baptists, the next following statement does. Baptists are experts that jump into conclusions. They are. They are. Two fellows standing out in the churchyard one night after service, and they were talking, up, just talking to each other, fellowshipping. Another man came out, and just about the time they came, he came out, he saw them. They were laughing, and one of them looked toward him. He said, they're talking about me. I used to pastor that fellow. Yeah. <laughs> now notice, now notice their conclusion they jumped to. No doubt this man is a murderer. That was their conclusion. They hadn't got introduced. Here he is soaking wet, just got out of the ocean. And all of a sudden, they're building a fire and he's trying to warm. A serpent hits him and they said, mm-hmm, God's getting you. You can't even get a bad cold among Baptists today, except they, they think God's beating the soup out of you. They think you've done something. That's right. You stumped your toe. And they said, uh-huh, God's getting you. You're nuts if you think like that. You're not that far from a blooming idiot. God's not a God like that. Come on now, get your head up. I'll let you know when we're going to pray. <laughs> Said he's a murderer, though whom though he escaped the rather sea, yet vengeance suffers not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Now watch the next verse. How be it they looked, how be it they looked, how be it they looked, when he should have swollen. See, they were Baptists because they expect him to swell up. Baptists swell up quicker than anybody are fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while, after they had looked a great while, after they had looked, they were staring at him, folks, they were staring at him. They were, after they had looked a great while, and so no harm come to him, oh, I like this, they changed their minds. They changed their minds, and notice now, and said that he was a god, from a murderer to a god. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? And said he was a god. Now today, I, I want to preach. They call me, they say I'm a practical preacher. A little boy walks up to me not long ago and said, Oh, I love to hear you preach. I don't hear that much, so I wanted to know why. And he said, The reason I like to hear you preach, I can understand what you're talking about. I'm somewhat put out with this crowd of preachers that go down deep and stay down long and come up dry. And I haven't understood a the thing they're talking about. Yes, and then there's another crowd over on what they call the old-fashioned bunch. I went to hear a preacher preach some time ago. And I got there a little late. And they was letting another man preach before he preached. And I was sitting out on the back pew. And this other preacher was up preaching. And uh, he had him attuned to it. And he, he was really going to it. And, and uh, you know, I sat down by one man. He was jumping up and down and shouting. And, and he looked down at me and said, boy, that's preaching, ain't it? I said, fellow, I can't understand the thing he's saying. He said, I can't either, but that's good preaching. I guess the reason there is how I'm a practical preacher, I want to give you something you can take home with you. I want to give you a message today that will help you. That's something that you can retain and keep. It won't be deep. There'll be, there'll be no half a dollar words in it. Maybe a couple of quarter words and two dime words and a, maybe a few nickel words. But I believe you'll understand what I'm talking about. And after they had looked a great while, after they had looked a great while, not just a glance, not just a glance, they literally stared at him. Notice the little preacher, wet, 
trying to help the fire out. They'd put some kindling, but kindling don't last long. And he said, I got to get something on here that'll burn. He threw a few logs on. And out of the heat came a serpent, landed on his arm, on his hand, and he shook it off into the fire and felt no harm. They were staring at that. They said, uh-huh. Though vengeance is su though he suffered to live vengeance, he's going to die. He's going to die. But notice here's a man now that they were staring at. I want to preach on this simple text. Somebody's watching you. Somebody's watching your life. Here's a man they had never met. But suddenly... They started looking at him. I believe the world has a right to look at you and I. Sure. I believe that. Yes, sir. You jump up and say hallelujah, glory to God, praise his name. I believe the world said, mm, I believe I'm going to watch him. You go down through here with your bumper in the back of your car covered up on with slogans. Oh, I love Jesus. And oh, boy, praise the Lord for Jesus. I believe the world said, mm, I'm going to watch him. And I believe they have that right. Now, let me ask you a question. What should the world look at and see? What should they see in our life? First of all, I believe they ought to see a changed life. Yes. I believe it's time that when we name the name of Christ, that we are to depart from evil. Yes. I believe that. I believe the world has a right to expect more out of us than they do out of the world. Yes, sir. Amen. Preach. Amen. Yes, sir. Go ahead, preach. That's it. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. 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 When I say I love the Lord, I want the world to know it's real. Amen. Hey, Amen. you can look at me, not me, but Christ in me, the hope of glory. And they were staring. I believe they have a right to look at you. Mamas, daddies, I believe those kids that see you in church and wave your hands and hear you say, Whoa! I believe they have a right to watch you at home. Amen. If you display kindness and godliness and righteousness and holiness here, I believe it ought to run up and down those streets out there in your life. Yes, sir. Do I hear an amen right there? Amen. Yes, sir. I believe that. And the sad, sad fact is they are watching you. You say, well, preacher blue. It's that old beer joint down the street. If we could just burn that thing down and get rid of it, I believe our church buildings would fill up. Boy, if we could get rid of prostitution and X-rated movies. Oh, if we get oh, I like that. I wish we could. But that ain't what's bothering us. Yes, sir. That ain't what's bothering us. You know what's wrong? Somebody's been watching you. Somebody's looking at you. Somebody knows you. A son of a deacon said to me one day in Dallas, Preacher, is anybody real? And I said, I certainly hope so, young man. He said, My dad is a deacon here. And he said, He shouts and sings in the quartet. But I was looking in one of the closets at the house the other day for something, and I found my daddy's Playboy magazines. I found his pornography collection and said, Preacher, I'm quitting the church. I'm quitting. All oh, friend, listen to me. I'm against all the aforementioned things. But God help us that they may see something real in us and know that that's phony. God help us. That's it. Preach. A young man said, I got sick one day and come home from school. My mama shouts in church. My mama's. Been shouting ever since I was a baby in church. 
I didn't knock at the door. It's my house. I didn't have to unlock the door, but I walked in. I went down the hall and found my mama in a bed with a man that wasn't my daddy. Come on now. See, we may have put on our Sunday go to meeting clothes here. We may smell like Avon call. And we may have everybody around here fool. But somebody's been watching you. Somebody has been watching you. I believe they ought to see something real. I believe they ought to see a life that's been touched from above. I believe they ought to see a life that's been changed. I'll never forget my blessed daddy when he got saved. He's at home now. We met having a revival over the church. Said, "Why, why?" Said, uh, "You ought to go to church." He cussed us all out and said, I'm going to go get drunk. He told me later, said, I went down the railroad going to the bootlegger's house and said something to get the deal with me. He said, I think I'll cut across the field and go over to that church and see what that bunch of hypocrites are doing. He said, I got over there that day and I walked in the door and the old man was a preaching. He said, I thought I'll stand up in the door, but said, I wound up at the altar. Well, I was back over at the house taking care of my mama that was sick in bed and couldn't go. And I was out in the yard playing. Mama was a saint and prayed. And all of a sudden I heard mama in the house say, Woo! See, God had sent her a telegram and telling her what was happening. <laughs> I never went to church much. I had daddy bootleg. I carried whiskey bottles to bootleg in. I didn't know much about it, but I went in and there was mama in the bed saying, Woo! I said, Mama, you you want a glass of water? <laughs> Come to find out later, she was drinking from that fountain that never did run dry. Amen. And I said, Mama, let me. She said, Whoa! I said, Lord God, she's going to die, and I'm the only one here. <laughs> I went back out in the yard, and she was still in there having that spell. And I'm out there trying to play, and I heard Daddy coming through the woods going, Whoa! I said, Lord God, he's drunk on some mean whiskey. He'll kill us all. <laughs> I said, I'm going under the floor. <laughs> About that time, he come around the corner of the house and grabbed me up in his arms. Done something he never had done before. Begin to kiss me on the cheek and sing, I love you, I love you, I love you. And run on in the house with me under his arm like a sack of taters. And got mama up and said, Mama, you got a brand new husband. I got born again. Amen. Glory. That bunch of drunks that he run with said he'll never make it. He'll be drunk next week. But the years went by and the days went by and the months went by. And they ordained my daddy as a deacon and he'll live for God for years. And that crowd that watched him said he's real, he's real, he's real. I sat by his bedside before he went home to be the Lord. He said, son, help me sing a song. And we sang two men sitting there in the dark. I'll meet you in the morning by the bright riverside. Amen. Amen. Something was different in his life. A change had been made. I saw it. Everybody saw it. Yes, sir. Somebody said, I wonder why my son quit church. Oh, I, I believe if we'd have changed preachers, he might have kept coming. Or if we'd have changed deacons. Or if we'd have changed carpet and got DuPont 501. And, or if we'd have got new carpet drapes. And, oh, I, my son. No, it may not be none of that. They may have been watching you, Mama. Preach. Daddy, they may have saw that ugly temper. They may have heard you say those curse words. They may have saw you watching and going to the refrigerator drinking that bud stupid. Yeah, right. Come on. You all right? I know I'm all right. Yes, sir. 
Amen. <laughs> Amen. Somebody's watching you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. May I ask you today sincerely, may I ask you this morning as I stand here trying my best to be obedient and sensitive to the Holy Spirit, if your child were to suddenly need somebody to pray for them, would they come to you and say, I've got more confidence in you than anybody. I've watched you live for God. If they needed somebody to pray for them, would they ask you? I wonder why it always gets so quiet right there. I wonder why you're so quiet. Why aren't you waving your hands? I'll step back if you want to shout. No, dear friend. There's many today of your children that have watched you so carefully. They know you better than I, but they would not probably ask you to pray. Somebody is watching your life. Somebody sees you. They should see, first of all, a changed life. Then they should see a concerned life. Who are you concerned about, really? Come on, anybody want to tell me? Who are you concerned about? Me and mine? And ours? I believe they should be a concern for souls more than anything. It's amazing to me how many people say they've been saved, but they're not concerned. Yes, sir. What concern? No, no concern. No concern at all. There is no attitude that says, I care for you. Nothing. Nothing that would tell others, I'm so concerned. I'm concerned about my church. I'm concerned about my preacher. I'm concerned about my brothers and sisters. I'm concerned about missions. I'm concerned. I'm concerned. I'm concerned, I care, I'm concerned, I'm concerned, I'm concerned. I watched Frank Ross for the first time I ever saw him. Had the raggedest, ugliest old briefcase I ever saw in my life. Honest. If I, if I ever saw a briefcase that I thought had boogers in it, that indeed. <laughs> Honest. But you know what kept Frank out on the road for years and years? Are you still going a lot, Frank? You know what's kept him out there? Concern. 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 You know what'll keep you on your knees praying in the late midnight hours? It's not religion, it's concern. It's concern. It's concern. It's concern. It's concern. It's concern. It's I care, I care, I care. Yeah. I believe when they watch you, they'll see someone that said, I'm, I'm concerned about my neighbor. I'm concerned about that man on the job. I'm concerned about those people I meet in the streets. Most Baptists got saved and their favorite song became, I shall not be moved. They just don't care. They're not concerned. I ministered for 12 years in the prison ministry. Some of the greatest memories that I have today are walking so tired my legs were aching in the late midnight hours around down prison blocks and prisons I couldn't get to them all that day and they got the news out if they'd stay up I'd come in the night and I've had men uh, carry tracks by the box loads and Bibles and pencils and pieces of candy with me and I've walked prison halls day and night somebody said why because I cared I 
cared. And I believe we ought to be concerned, don't you? First of all, they should see a changed life. And they should see a concerned life. And I believe they should see compassion, don't you? It's amazing today how many of us have got a religious indoctrination but no compassion. We pick out folks we want in our church. We go by the more exclusive sections. You know, the big cars and the two-car garages and the... Oh, you know, all the, uh, the nice Kepler and all, all the, oh, the, we want that. But just down the street on the other side of the track, maybe a shack with beer cans in the yard and a skinny dog and little old kids that show malnutrition and a little pale girl that left a home and they have nothing, they're drunks and maybe they were scavengers of the gutter. But I believe there ought to be a compassion that will reach out from us to say to them, we want you saved. Amen. Yes, sir. And unless the Christ you say you have in your heart is one that tells you to go tell them, I don't believe you know the Christ that I'm talking about. Yes, sir. Somebody's watching you. When you step out your door of a morning, I wonder if you've ever told your neighbor about Jesus. Well, we don't get along. Our kids had a fight one day 15 years ago, and we never have spoke to him. <laughs> How about let me stick out my fist and you run into it about 100 miles an hour? You're crippled too high for crutches. You're sick, boy. Somebody needs to knock a spiritual knot on your head big enough to grow grass. Sure. <laughs> Before our blessed daddy passed away and went home to be the Lord got promoted. He was sick and he couldn't get out very much. And he'd sat in the yard and there was two girls that were girls of the night, street prostitutes, used to come down by his house of a day and he'd sit in the yard and say, I'm I'm a praying for you. I love you because you need to know Jesus. The day of his funeral was rain and the building was full, packed full. The preacher started preaching. Old girl jumped up and said, I want to get saved. He said, he sat in the, he sat in his yard and told me about Jesus with tears running down his cheeks. <clears throat> if I wasn't so dignified, I'd shout right here. Well, I have compassion. Well, it's just a little old bitty boy. Y'all have compassion to say, I love your son. Yes. Just an old girl. She is no good. You know, she's a prostitute. She's a harlot. Y'all have compassion and realize that Christ died for her. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that blood. Wash all their old sins away. My old Cherokee grandmother used to sit on the porch late in the evening. I can't remember all the song, but part of it I remember. Sang in a minor key. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. What wondrous Love is this that calls my soul to bliss when I was sinking down, sinking down, sinking down when I was sinking down, cry. Laid aside his crown for my soul. Well, hallelujah. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Amen. Amen. Somebody is watching you. Then there may be somebody watching you and you don't know anything about it. They've never written you a letter and said, I'm going to watch you. They've never had announced on the TV that they're going to watch you. But they're watching you and you don't know about it. I remember my wife and I and my children had been to Chicago to preach in a revival. A young church, little church, storefront building, you know the part. Got there. Oh, God had evidently been blessing, been tremendous. We got in the meeting, and I don't know why it was. I have no I don't to this day. I don't know what happened. But I preached that night, and the pastor got mad at me and went and sat down on the back pew, crossed his arm, and dropped his lower lip. And I said, Preacher, are you mad? He said, Yes. Well, I said, Now, I've been struck out the first time. And there's no need of me staying. There's just no need of me staying. I might as well leave. And so my intentions was to leave. Somebody may be watching you. You don't know about it. And so I announced to the people. I said, there's no need of me staying. And all that young church met me in the altar. And they said, preacher, don't leave. Please don't. We've prayed a year to get you here. We've prayed a year for you to come. Don't leave. I said, now, if you're worried about the pastor being mad, I said, don't worry about that. I said, he's mad most of the time anyhow. <laughs> He said, don't leave, don't leave. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> but I said, you know, I, I never done it before. I never had a pastor mad sitting on the back pew before. I said, I'm a, I'm a, the Holy Ghost says, stay. I said, I'm staying. Amen. He sat there every night on that back pew mad as the devil. <laughs> and I just preaching, slobbering on five rows. I'd have me a ball. But you know, he had never trained that young group of folk, and they did not know about their responsibility toward me and my family to see about my needs financially. They just shouted all week, and I shouted with them, boy, we had a ball. They never took up an offering one time. They shouted her out, boy. I mean, we had a ball. I mean, listen, I, I skinned my shins, I run, I jump pews, they was after me, and I was after them, amen. We had a time. But the end of the week came, and I was broke as a convict. Nothing. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, talk, I'm talk, I say, I say, I say, I say, I, I say, I was broke. I mean, I was broke. I wasn't being, I was broke. Somebody had bought me a tank of gas to go home on, and I lived in Florida. <laughs> now, I believe in faith. <laughs> I believe God parted the ocean, <laughs> but he never had drove no Ford. <laughs> it would have never made it. <laughs> but we started. No money. Tank of gas. In a Ford. Heading down old Highway 41 out of Chicago. We was driving along, my two kids in the back. Somebody may be watching, you don't know about it. Driving along, and after a while, one of my kids said, Daddy, they're country girls. They are. Just stay like me and their mama. One of them spoke up and said, never said, I'm hungry. Said, I'm hungry. <laughs> that means your stomach thinks your throat's been cut. <laughs> hungry means something's got to be done fast. And my wife, bless her heart, she said, now you children play with your little games. It's hard to play with games when you're starving to death. <laughs> and they sat back there a little while. And after a while, I saw out on the side of the road a great big sign. I mean a huge sign that was advertising a restaurant that we are evidently approaching. And they said, known from coast to coast for our chicken and dumplings. And one of my girls could read. And she said, looky, daddy, looky, looky, looky. My wife said, play with your games. We drove a little piece, and there was that restaurant sitting by the side of the road. Cars parked everywhere. And I turned in, and my wife said, what are you doing? I'm always kind to my wife, and I never have been an abusive husband. That's one day I said, hush, woman. <laughs> hush. <laughs> 
And they said, my kids are hungry, I'm hungry, all of God's children's hungry. <laughs> and I know I'm broke, I've tried to please God, I've preached, I've shouted, I've jumped, I've hollered, I've done it all. And now I'm hungry! Somebody may be watching you, you don't know about it. I pulled into that restaurant, we got out, my wife was hanging onto my arm, almost cut the circulation off. <laughs> we in, went into the restaurant. Little waitress came around and said, this way, please. We followed her. She took us to a table. Somebody may be watching you. You don't know about it. Yes, yes. Took us to a table, set us down. She said, your waitress will be here momentarily. We waited. A little girl came to us and said, what can I do for her? I said, lady, was that sign right? On that sign had a picture, a big platter. I don't mean little bitty I mean a big old platter, and it had a picture, that artist was superb. It had a picture of, of, of that dough that had been turned yellow, you know, and hunks of chicken, and old bones of chicken legs sticking up out of it, and the steam of going up like that. And I said, was you that sign telling the truth? I said, now, it's not them little bitty shallow dishes. She said, you'll do good if you can eat all of it. I said, bring us three heifers. <laughs> My wife kicked me under the table. I said, don't do it again. <laughs> she had to get a waitress to help her carry it out of the kitchen. I mean, four big Platters. I mean big. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean big. She set it down on the table. We joined the hands around the table, my two girls and my precious wife. And I said, Lord Jesus, I've tried to serve you and please you. I've tried to be faithful in preaching that book. And I've tried to do, and Lord Jesus, we're hungry. And we've come in here to eat, and I want you to bless this food to nourish us. Amen. Yeah. Mm. Best dumplings I've ever ate in my life. I mean, we ate the whole thing. All of it. The little waitress come back and she said, what will you have for dessert? I said, what you got? She said, apple cub. Ha! I thought to myself, I do not want her to arrive at the conclusion that I'm a country hick. I am going to throw my French at her. Let her know that I can speak French. I straightened up in my chair and took my napkin off of my lap and wiped the corners of my mouth. And I said, bring us four apple cobblers, Ollie mode. You could tell that impressed her. I spoke French. She came back with the apple cobbler, melting ice cream protruding down through it. My wife's fork was the first one that hit the dish. We ate it! We wiped our mouth with our napkins and gathered our ticket up and headed for the cash register. Somebody may be watching, you don't know about it. I handed my ticker, ticket to the cashier and she started to mash the button and she said, wait a minute, are you the family that was seated right back there? And I said, yes ma'am, we were. She said, you don't owe anything. Mm. <laughs> yeah, mm. yeah, mm. And I said, what'd you say? She said, you don't know anything. Somebody may be watching you, you don't know about it. And she said, a man came by here a while ago wearing a big Texas hat. And said, young lady, I don't know that family right back there. But said, they joined hands in here a while ago and asked the blessing. And said, I want to pay for their lunch, whatever it is, and I'll give you this, and it's covered, maybe enough for a tip. 
You remember the other day when you went down to McDonald's and you remember the other day in your rudeness and your impoliteness? When somebody, an old sinner, was in McDonald's that day, he was under conviction. Oh, he saw you the other church, other day in church, and he picked you out because you shouted more than anybody and said, Boy, that man would probably tell me how to get to Jesus. But he saw you down at a McDonald's the other day. You got your sandwich. You was rude and you were ashamed to bow your head and say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for this sandwich. And he was waiting to see that man that he woman that he picked out in church. He knew, he just knew that you would pray and ask God to bless it. But how amazed he was that you were ashamed of that Jesus you so loudly proclaimed you loved on Sunday. I wonder who will go to hell because they watched you. If you were the only Christian in the world, if you were the only one, there was not another, how many people would go to heaven because of you? Or because you were the only one, I wonder how many people would die and go to hell because of you. When in a better land, before the bar we stand, how deeply grieved our souls may be. If any lost one there should cry in deep despair, you never mention him to me. You never mentioned him to me. He helped me not the light to see. You met me day by day. And you knew I was astray. Yet you never mentioned him. To me. Would you come to the instruments, please? I want you to stand now and bow your heads and close your eyes. I wonder who there is here today that's been watching you this week. I wonder will they walk out of that door and said, Everybody's phony, play softly, please. I wonder if there's somebody here today that this will be the last chance they'll get to come to church. This is the last altar they'll see sitting down front. But I wonder if it's because the way you've lived, they may leave here lost without God. Every head bowed, every eye closed, every Christian praying. First, I wonder if there's someone here today that does not know my Christ. You do not know the Savior that I represent. And you know, I, you say, I'd like to be saved, preacher. I need to be. Will you raise your hand right now and say, pray for me? I'm lost, Brother Ed. I do not know that Christ. I'm lost. Raise up that hand anywhere in the house. Anywhere. I wonder if there's someone here right now that you've drifted so far from God. Your life is not the testimony it ought to be. It's not one that will lead someone to Christ. I wonder if there's someone here today that will raise your hand and say, Preacher, that message, God sent it to me. God spoke to me. God dealt with me. God spoke to my heart through that message. I wonder, would you raise your hand right now? And say, Brother Blue, I need prayer. I'm not living the life I ought to live. I'm not living like I should live. I wonder, would you raise that hand right now and say, Pray for me. Anywhere? Anywhere in the house, anywhere on my right, anywhere in the house, just slip up your hand and say, I need prayer, preacher. Oh, I haven't been one somebody should look at. Brother Blue, my life is not one that somebody can look at and see Jesus in. I wonder, would you raise your hand and say, pray for me. Pray for me. In the choir.
Father, I've tried to be faithful. I've tried to be sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And now, my Father, may the Holy Ghost work in hearts. May that mother that her, her children have not seen Jesus in like they should. Maybe that daddy that's never bowed with his son in prayer. Maybe that mother that her kids have never saw her with an open Bible on her lap. May today this altar be filled with men and women that said, I want, us, I want people to see Jesus in me. When they look at me, I want them to see I'm real. I'm not a phony. Have your way now as our brother directs us in our invitation hymn. For Christ's sake, amen. Let's sing and will you come. Just as 